rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. Quite on set. You want to know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is, in fact, the classic solution in search of a problem. Action it cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. Welcome to the FedSoc Films Podcast. I'm Samantha Schroeder, Deputy Director of FedSoc Films. Today's episode is inspired by our film, American Cincinnatus, which explores the parallels between founding father, founding farmer, and first president of the United States, George Washington, and Cincinnatus, a Roman statesman, farmer, and military leader who, in a life similar to George Washington's, gave up the offer of near-absolute power over his people and instead laid down his sword and returned to his farm. When Washington declined to seek a third term as president of the newly formed United States, he wrote a farewell address that became one of the most famous statements in American history. Today, we have Allison Wickens, vice president of education at George Washington's Mount Vernon, here to discuss something we only touch on in the film, Washington's presidential farewell address. Welcome to the show, Allison. Thanks so much, Samantha. It's great to be here. So Allison, tell us about your work at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Oh, I'm so glad you got asked. Um, I'm the vice president for education at George Washington's Mount Vernon, which means that I have the amazing and incredible responsibility of ensuring that people all over the country and all over the world really have an opportunity to learn about George Washington, um, his life, his legacy, um, and the leadership that he showed in, in his time, but also that's relevant in our world today. Um, it's, a wonderful opportunity for people when they get to visit Mount Vernon. Um, We have an immersive, um, you know, landscape where they can explore the original buildings and structures that George Washington um, had built and lived in, but as well as explore his ideas um, through our museum and our audio tour, all sorts of wonderful things to do when you're on site. But in addition to that, I get to oversee uh, great learning resources that we share with uh, students and teachers around the country um, so that they can um, bring this type of work into their classroom. And we've also launched a, a series of online um, videos that um, and book talks that are accessible and, and I think interesting for anybody interested in history. That's awesome. So this post-election year began with a presidential farewell address. What is the purpose of a presidential farewell address, and why was Washington so memorable? Well, I think the the purpose of a farewell address has changed over time, and we see different presidents using that opportunity for different reasons. But in general, it it tends to be a a chance to share wisdom, the wisdom that the president gained while they were in office. Um, Sometimes being able to offer that at at a personal level, once they're stepping down from the role of president, they can really be thinking about what they learned and what they hope people will take away from their experience. Um, Sometimes that advice is is very much driven by um, policy, you know, recommendations. Andrew Jackson, um, in his farewell address, um, specifically was very adamant about being clear about what the banking policy should be um, after he stepped down. Sometimes it's more of um, warning or cautious advice. Uh, Reagan and Obama um, both provided farewell addresses that were specifically about um, what to do um, from their personal perspectives. And I think Washington's really stands out. Um, well, because it was first, he sort of, as in so many things in his presidency, set the precedent for a farewell address. But in truth, it's become such a timeless document. Um, it's really, I think he wrote it um, in that idea to share the wisdom he gained while he was in office. Um, and it's indicative, I think, the advice he gives as what the challenges to our great experiment in federalism is. Um, he was really thinking about why it was hard to govern as a president and wanting to make sure that um, that the citizens in the, this young, very young United States understood what the threats to governing might be. That's great. I'd like to play an excerpt from Washington's farewell address. Take a listen. Relying on its kindness in this as in other things, and actuated by that fervent love towards it, which is so natural to a man who views in it the native soil of himself and his progenitors for several generations. I anticipate with pleasing expectation that retreat, in which I promise myself to realize without alloy the sweet enjoyment of partaking in the midst of my fellow citizens. 
the benign influence of good laws under a free government, the ever-favorite object of my heart, and the happy reward, as I trust, of our mutual cares, labors, and dangers. So, Allison, why is this last paragraph your favorite part of his farewell address? Well, I think it really crystallizes this idea of Washington looking forward to becoming a citizen, uh, becoming part of what he had been leading as president. Um, He specifically says in this section that he's looking forward to um, joining the the fellow citizens as being a part of the experiment. Um, And I love the fact that he really frames this idea of self-governance or um, as a favorite object of his heart. Um, If there's one thing that we should remember Washington for, it's how much he loved and cherished um, self-governance and the the great experiment of democracy, because he even says here in the farewell address how much he um, he loves it. So I think that's kind of why this this quote always speaks to me. Um, he's not only stepping down from power, he is specifically looking forward to being a part of the citizenry um, and joining all those fellow citizens um, in creating good laws um, and working together mutual cares, labors, and dangers. Um, He recognizes that democracy is hard work um, and that it's going to take a lot of effort, but it will also bring a lot of rewards. So I think that last paragraph kind of sums up that. Um, Earlier on in the document, he spends a lot of time really specifically calling out the threats to democracy. um, And I I really think that um, it's nice to end on the benefits and the why why it's work why it's worth excuse me uh, focusing on those threats because of the great benefits that comes out of it. So, how did Washington deliver his farewell address? Yeah, a lot of times when we think about a farewell address, especially when we think about the presidents who have given them um, more recently, we think about uh, uh, standing in front of a crowd at a podium, perhaps. Uh, But Washington actually published his farewell address. It was a written document published in September 1796. Um, And the purpose of the document, uh, when it was printed in newspapers around the country, was to let the nation know that he was not going to be pursuing um, a third term. So if we think about uh, what the election would have been in November of 1796, this was published just two months before um, what would have elected him to a to a third um, a third term in the president's office. So he wanted to um, get that information out to as many people as possible. And before television, radio, um, all the media that we have today, the fastest way to do that would be to print these remarks in newspapers so that they could be um, shared across the country. Interesting. So what, what would you say is Washington's primary concern when drafting his presidential farewell address? So his primary concern when drafting the farewell address really um, came down to wanting to make sure that uh, unity was possible. Um, the, the way in which the nation was designed with a central government as well as independent state governments meant that uh, power was shared across different um parts of the government. And so the the big challenge that pre- creates a challenge to unity. Um, and he saw three specific threats to that unity that he ha- calls out specifically. The first one is regionalism. He really wanted to make sure as this farewell address was being read by everybody across the country, that people in the southern um, United States and the northern United States um, saw commonalities between each other, um, and especially the growing population in the Western states, which at that point um, were relatively new to the Union. And then um, in second, he was really advising against partisanship. Um, He really pointed to the factions that were forming that would become the political parties um, by the end of his term, um, and really feeling that they were specifically um, challenging to um, to unity because a party could ask for loyalty to its own ideas instead of um, the nation as a whole. And then finally, he warns against foreign influence. Um, he didn't um, think that 
the United States should be an isolationist country, but he did think that it needed to prioritize um, and never connect itself with one country across all things. Um, and so this was particularly something important to him in um, the tensions with uh, um, Great Britain and the in the Jay Treaty that had just come forward during the second uh, part of his presidency. So really just um, the farewell address is a chance for him to um, make sure people are thinking about their um, regionalism, their partisanship and foreign influence and the threats that could have on unity of the nation. Got it. So do you think Washington opting to share his farewell address as a pamphlet with all of America rather than an an in-person event, um, an address reinforced his intention of unifying his people? I definitely think that it was always important to him that he was communicating to the whole nation. So um, again, the media at the time, newspapers were the best way um, to do that um, in pamphlets, as you reference. The um, one of the indicators to this um, important technique of his was his um, commitment to travel during his presidency, to going on tours of the, um, making sure that he's visiting all of the states. So I think that that indicates, yeah, that it was really important for him that everybody got a chance to hear his words or read his words um, again, because they couldn't really hear them on a radio <laughs> since they hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> I guess hear his words in their own minds through the medium of the written mm-hmm. word. <laughs> Um, so well, and also, I mean, it, oh, I was just going to say, many of the people weren't um, able to read. So even though his words were distributed, written, they would have been read in taverns in communities around the country for um, by the person who could read the best in those communities. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't even think of that. Um, so, what would you say is significant about Washington's declining to seek a third term? Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, it's it's a powerful decision and one that he made um, with a lot of intent. Of course, he was looking forward to, um, you know, returning to Mount Vernon. It's one of the stories we tell when um, when visitors come to our site. Um, but I think more important in his mind was he wanted to make sure that the experiment, uh, this United States of America, extended beyond his unique role in its founding. You know, there really was no other George Washington at the time, no one else who would have been unanimously elected, um, not once but twice to the presidency. Um, And he saw that the executive branch was a critical component of the nation and how the government structured, and he needed to make sure that that... um, elections could happen to put someone else in that powerful position. Um, And he didn't want to set a precedent as well um, by dying in office um, and not having an opportunity for the public to choose who got to fill the executive role. And so him stepping down, him deciding deciding not to seek a third term was really his test um, to demonstrate the the power and the vision of the... uh, the grand experiment that is the United States of America. So the title of our film is American Cincinnatus, George Washington Lays Down His Sword. Why was George Washington compared to the Roman leader Cincinnatus? Well, um, yeah, the, the, co- the comparison to Cincinnatus actually came about when he was leading the, um, the, the, Continental Army, excuse me, I almost called it the United States Army, it hadn't been formed in that model yet, the Continental Army. Um, and his decision to step down from power um, was was first really visible and celebrated and honored when he was the general of these forces. And at the end of the American Revolution, uh, with the British um, acquiescing, the um, George Washington went to the government, the elected body, um, then um, governed by the Articles of Confederation, and turned in his sword, turned in his um, resignation from the army, therefore demonstrating that the civilian control of the military forces in this newly formed nation. And that is a model that Cincinnatus um, in the Roman times also enacted. And at this point, when somebody would have so much control, um, so much power, 
um, not only in his stature and his um, familiarity and authority, but also with the guns um, that the military controlled um, and the arms. Him saying, this all, all these decisions belong to the civil government and I'm turning over my sword. Um, and, you know, this is um, a pattern that unfortunately doesn't always get repeated um, when revolutions happen and so often the military retains control um, and doesn't turn over that power back to the civilian authority. And so unfortunately, we've we've seen revolutions turn um, to military dictatorships. And, and it's important for us all to remember that that didn't happen um, in the United States. And it didn't happen at that start because Washington um, step down from power. Um, and I think the comparison to Cincinnati is also so resonant because Cincinnati and Washington were also committed to agriculture um, and really thinking about um, Cincinnati as a farmer. George Washington's um, ideal was a nation of farmers. His um, his passion was was growing things. Um, his work um, contributing to the plantation at Mount Vernon was really all about the future being in the breadbasket of the world. He saw um, so many opportunities. Um, and in fact, he articulates this in um, his first, if we want to think about his first farewell address as being the address he gave to the army. Um, he was very passionate about supporting um, the members of the army after the American Revolution to move from fields of war to fields of agriculture. So were Americans surprised that Washington declined to seek a third term? Was that a very shocking decision um, in the eyes of the American people? Not only um, the eyes of the American people, but really the eyes of the world. Um, there, there, there'd never been in modern times this, uh, this form of government and having an elected official um, choose to give up power. Um, there was, you know, really reverberations around the world that this was unheard of. So um, I think people close to Washington in his cabinet, um, those he sought support and advice from, they were not surprised. He was, um, in fact, wanting to step down after four years um, of um, the presidency, but um, he was convinced to run for a second term. And um, and decided to move forward, um, you know, to to just help secure the 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 United States a little bit more fully. But but broadly, um, this seems just almost inconceivable that someone would leave this position of power by choice. And not only leave this position of power by choice, but to go back to the farm. Um, what is the significance of the parallel between George Washington and Cincinnati as farming leaders or farming, you know, commanders in chief? Yeah, I mean, I think this um, vision that Washington had um, of the strength of America being in many ways its land um, and thinking about how, um, you know, in Europe, um, there was no land for people to, to build from. But in the Americas, we had the opportunity to, um, to, to grow and to have, you know, farming material and um, and pull that forward. And so he was really thinking about it not only for his you know personal uh, passions and profits, uh, but also for um, America's role and responsibility in the world in agriculture. Fascinating. What do you think is a crucial element missing from uh, American education on George Washington as a leader? Oh, you know, there are so many facets to George Washington um, that, you know, I think we try to bring to light um, in the programming and the education that we do. I think, you know, one key element, too, is is the way in which Washington um, sort of it, it depended on and engaged on a lot of um, women and their voices. Sometimes we think of his cabinet as being, you know, it's an all-male cabinet and as the presidency. Um, but Washington was very interested in um, getting the input from the women in his social circles as well. Um, that these were deep um, thinkers in government. And, and in many ways, um, he could have more informal conversations with with women because they weren't part of the formal hierarchy um, in which he was sort of 
overseeing a lot of the work of the men in his life. And so we see, um, especially in Philadelphia during the presidency, um, women like um, Eliza Powell being able to host um, salons and contacts. And of course, Martha Washington was a, was a critical part of this um, sort of soft politicking um, that allowed Washington greater access to ideas um, across um, from men and women. I think another untold story about Washington um, that's important for uh, students and, and people all over the world to learn is about the fact that he was a slave owner as well. And um, that, you know, I was talking about how his, um, you know, commitment to farming and his plantation, it, it is important that we, we make sure that people understand that um, he did have enslaved workers, enslaved people that were um, you know, working on that land as well. So I think um, as we understand Washington, it's important to understand the context in which he was living um, and the challenges that other people were facing based on the decisions that he made. Do you know if Washington himself saw himself as Cincinnatus? You know, was he aware of this comparison and how did he feel about this you know, parallel? Um, he was certainly aware of the comparison. It was certainly, um, you know, very much in the public dialogue. Um, Washington himself um, did not accept um, compliments, did not accept laudations um, gracefully, effectively. He, um, you know, really was um, publicly uh, practiced a humble man and his um deference was always to the experiment itself and the service in which he was trying to provide to the nation, um, the service in which he was trying to provide. So we we don't see him um, reflecting on or talking about or extending that Cincinnatus um, analogy. He would have been incredibly humbled by it um, at the same time. I think often um, saw it as as a model as well. And what are some fun facts about George Washington that law school students might want to know about him? <laughs> law school students? Well, I'm imagining that um, they law school students may like to unwind a bit. Um, they um, Washington loved social gatherings, loved parties, um, was the most excellent dancer in the state of Virginia in the 18th century, as is recorded by many um, who both observed and danced with him. Um, so I think, you know, um, sometimes he was uncomfortable with the amount of education that a lot of his peers had had, where he stopped his formal schooling at 11. Um, but when it was just about talking over the dinner table, when it was about um, relaxing and dancing and, and challenging each other in, in, in broad ways, um, he was really able to relax and enjoy himself. Um, I also, you know, think that his love of parties and relaxing and dancing may have been reflected in the names that he gave his dogs. Uh, many people don't know how much Washington loved dogs um, and animals in general, but you know, if you come to Mount Vernon today, we always invite you to bring your dog along. Um, I think students might be excited to hear that he had dogs named um, Tipler and Taster and Drunkard, um, perhaps um, <laughs> in reference to their... Um, their alcohol um, enjoyment, but also Vulcan and Venus. Um, let's see, Sweet Lips, uh, True Love. <laughs> um, he had a Dalmatian he called Madame Moose. Um, so Washington <laughs> not only valued dogs and was actually um, the, uh, named as the father of the American um, fox hunter, fox hunting hound, excuse me, um, but also just um, had many dogs around naming them. Um, speaking of animals, another fun fact is he is also the father of the American mule. Um, the uh, wow. mules at the time were very um, precious because of the donkeys um, that were really held um, by the the king of Spain. And the king of Spain gifted a donkey um which he named Royal Gift to George Washington. So Washington was able to breed mules um, and um, and bring the American mule sort of to um, to the agriculture um, that he was so proud of. Some fun facts for you. Wow. 
those are certainly some fun facts. Um, so on the note of law school recommendations or recommendations for law school students, were there any books that George Washington read or are a part of his library that you think law school students or any students who are interested in George Washington might want to read or familiarize themselves with? Oh, you know, Washington was a was a voracious reader. And I like to say that um, if you look at Washington's library, you can map the, his 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 life. You see him reading military books. You see him reading agriculture books. You see him reading books about gardening, books about um, governing, um, and also books about um you know, the stories and the art of the past. So I think the the best advice I can give to students is embrace the variety in which Washington so cherished in their reading um, and really, you know, allow themselves to, to be um, broad consumers of lots of different ideas. That's definitely something that Washington was passionate about. Um, we know when he did um, read his books, he um, specifically was looking for ways to apply those um, books to the, to his life. He read for purpose. Um, I'm trying to think of a good title. There's there's a couple that come to mind. Um, one is um, let's see the um, Oh, I'm forgetting who it's uh, Don Quixote. There we go. Um, which was, of course, one of the earliest um, novels. Um, Washington um, had not read this book and actually at the Constitutional Convention um, purchased a copy of it after Benjamin Franklin had been talking about it. So we see him wanting to read what other people are, are talking about. Um, he purchases an English version of it and um, later... Um, the King of Spain also gives him a copy of the um, Spanish original version, a beautiful we have in the library at, at Mount Vernon, a beautiful copy. And um, and we know that that book was actually by his uh, deathbed um, when he passed away. It was one of the books he was reading. Wow, that's beautiful. So read Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about George Washington or his address? You know, I think the... Um, the thing that I'll leave you with, Samantha, is just um, an appreciation for Washington's intentionality. Uh, Washington was always really focused on what's the best thing, not for me, but what's the best thing for the community in which I live. Um, and he saw that community as um, the entire nation. And um, he really felt he had a unique vision to be able, through his um, commanding the army, through his presidency, at the point of his death, to be able to see um, the whole nation as part of his community and to be intentional about his decisions. Uh, we can see his intent in his, uh, his will, his last will and testament. Um, we get to see what he really wanted to think about and be his legacy. Um, and we see that commitment to unity through his desire to fund a national university where regionalism would not play into um, to pass. We see in that um, document his decision to uh, free the enslaved people um, that he had in enslaved, including um, immediate man manumission for William Lee, who um, fought in the Revolutionary War with him. So I think, you know, Understanding his intent, his intentionality in everything that he did um, is just raises respect for him in his lifetime and his relevance to today. Well, that was so interesting. Thank you, Allison, for joining us today for another episode of the FedSoc Films podcast. I really enjoyed learning all this fun fact information about George Washington today. Yeah, definitely. Our guest today was Allison Wickens, Vice President of Education at George Washington's Mount Vernon. You can check out our film, American Cincinnatus, George Washington Lays Down His Sword, on YouTube, Facebook, or at fedsoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of the FedSoc Films Podcast. As always, the Federalist Society doesn't take any positions on the issues discussed. That's a wrap. This has been a FedSoc audio production.